This will be a video about Latvian War of Independence. The war overlaps with Russian Civil War, Germany's post-war battles and Polish-Russian War. So the time is just after the Great War. The last big-scale German attack on the Eastern Front was in the beginning of 1918. All of Baltic lands, Latvia, Estonia and Lithuania were occupied by Germans, just like huge areas elsewhere on the east of Russian Empire. After which Germany signed peace with Russia. Of course, it already was Soviet Russia with communists in power. But, as we know, Germany was not the winner of the Great War. There was a revolution in Germany and the power went to the democratic parties. And on 11th November, Germany signed armistice with the Western Allies. Latvia used an opportunity and declared independence on 18th of November. Provisional government of Latvia was formed and was officially recognized by Germany. Yet Latvian territory still stayed occupied by German army, 8th army, according to the rules of armistice. Couple days after Germany signed armistice with the West, Soviet Russia annulled its peace treaty. Russia decided that it is the right moment to start large-scale strategic offensive to the West. Not to merely restore the old imperial borders, but with a bigger goal – to bring the revolution to Europe. There was a revolutionary situation in Europe, as communists put it. With the Red Army's help, communists would take power in Germany and afterwards a revolution would spread to the West. With such strategic goals in mind, Russia's fate was not that important. The Great Western Offensive was not terribly well prepared. Russia did not have that many resources in the time of raging civil war. This was an attack of opportunity relying on Germany's and its army's weakness. The same democratic processes that were used to ruin Russian army now existed in the German army. German soldiers didn't want to fight, there were soldiers' councils on all levels of the army. To maintain order, or at least guard the army's property, volunteer units were formed, but that was all. Offensive was envisioned to be painted as the people's own yearning to be liberated from the Germans. That was not completely false, because Latvians at the time were mostly sympathetic to communism. Red Latvian riflemen, formed into units during the Great War and since acquired legendary fame, were coming with the Red Army. But what was happening with the Latvian Army? The truth was that Latvian Army consisted merely of couple companies. Firstly, public sympathies were not on provisional government's side. Secondly, Latvian state was almost powerless. German occupational regime did not rush to give power away. Thirdly, German administration actively hindered the formation of the Latvian army. Instead, it provided help to formation of Baltic German militia, called Landeswehr. Baltic Germans represented a small percentage of the population, but for historical reasons held huge power and property in their hands. For Baltic Germans, both Soviet rule and democratic Latvia were almost the same evil, as that would mean the end of class society and loss of historical privileges. In the beginning, offensive was conducted by two armies, already existing 7th Army and newly formed Western Army. The 7th Army moved in two columns. First column to Valka, this was the 2nd Latvian Rifle Brigade of three regiments. Second column along railroad from Pitalovo, this was 2nd Novgorod Division of four regiments. Western Army moved towards Daugopils. These first marches were almost bloodless. The Red Army simply negotiated with German units that they would leave their positions and retreat. The German army used an opportunity to evacuate its property to Germany. In the middle of December, Latvian riflemen took Valka and immediately government of Soviet Latvia moved in. The Western Army's Pskov division took Daugopils, still without battle. In the middle of the month, the 1st Latvian Rifle Brigade of two regiments and Special International Division of four regiments arrived and were allocated to the Western Army. Pskov division later moved to Lithuania and was renamed into Lithuanian Rifle Division. On 22nd December, there was the first real battle for town of Valmier. Town was occupied by German volunteer battalion. Latvian riflemen, it was the first regiment, approached from the north, surrounded the town and after some shootout, Germans left Valmier. Twenty Germans were taken prisoner, Rig was threatened. Landeswehr's leadership sent hastily assembled Baltic German battalion to stop the Red advance. On 26 December there was a chaotic clash at Ligatne, after which Germans retreated to Inchukauns. Meanwhile, in Riga, one of the companies formed by Latvian government mutinied. It was disarmed with the help of English ship artillery, leader shot. Near Inchukauns on 31st December and 1st of January of the next year, a bigger battle between Landeswehr and 2nd Latvian Rifle Brigade happened. As the result, Landeswehr retreated to Riga. The battle was not large, but important in ideological sense. For it, red units were awarded with the red combat banners. 
Realizing that Riga in such circumstances was not defendable, Latvian government and German administration evacuated to the west. On the Red Army's side, on 4th January, a Soviet Latvian army was formed from all Latvian units in Latvia and International Division. The army was positioned between the 7th Army and the Western Army. Existing Latvian Rifle Division became 1st Rifle Division of Soviet Latvia, but International Division became basis of the 2nd Rifle Division of Soviet Latvia. It was supposed to consist of the original Russian regiments and new regiments formed in the future. Army of Soviet Latvia was divided in three groups. Second Brigade of the 1st Division remained in Riga. First Brigade moved to Jalgava and Mazeikai. International Division along the railroad to Šauljai. On 14 January, in response to heavy fights in Estonia, a fourth group was created in the north with 3rd Brigade and 2nd Brigade. Estonian army in the north, together with Finns and White Russians, had reconquered all Estonian territory, therefore reaching the Latvian border. Ruyen in Latvia was lost by Red Army, then retaken, then lost again. Valka was lost on 1st of February. So, despite that Riga and majority of Latvia was occupied without much effort, around this time Red Army's offensive to the west had already exhausted itself. The 1st Brigade and less combat-capable International Division stayed in the western direction, but other two brigades of the 1st Division had to hold the front in the north. Western offensive was delayed until warmer season. As for the white forces, they moved first to Jalgava and then to the west to Liepāja. Latvian army consisted of one battalion that comprised all available forces that were left since leaving Riga. On the retreat to Liepāja, it had its first battle on 16th January near Lielauce. Red 2nd Latvian regiment attacked the battalion but was beaten back. Finally, anti-communist forces retreated to Venta River line. Landeswehr's forces were in Kuldiga and Skrunda to the South Latvian Battalion, further German volunteers. In the end of January, Skrunda town was lost, but on 29th January retaken by Landeswehr and Latvian Battalion. So, there were four armies in the anti-communist front. German army, Landeswehr or Baltic German army, Latvian army, only one battalion, and a small white Russian force. Latvians and Russians were subordinated to Landeswehr's headquarters, but Landeswehr to the headquarters of the German 6th Reserve Corps, in whose hands rested the leadership of the White Front in Latvia and Northern Lithuania. An arrangement was made between Latvia and Estonia that it allowed to create national Latvian army units in Estonian territory. On 1st February, General von der Goltz arrived in Liepāja to become the commander of 6th Reserve Corps. From now on, he led all the anti-communist forces in Latvia and Northern Lithuania. Von der Goltz's mission was to defend the German borders, to prevent the Red Army's threat to Germany. There were not many forces on the quite long front line. Landeswehr in the north, then Latvian battalion, then German volunteers, who were integrated into Iron Division. As reinforcements, 6th Reserve Corps received the 1st Guards Reserve Division, that was positioned in the southern end of the front, in northern Lithuania. Latvian army still consisted from one battalion, because Germans by all means hindered expansion of Latvian forces. Two attempts to organize mobilization were banned, weapons received from British had to be kept on ships so they wouldn't be confiscated. On the front line in February there were local advances that straightened the line in preparations for a bigger offensive. On 13th February Landeswehr retook Kuldiga, on 24th February in preparations for larger scale offensive it took Ventspils. In northern Latvia Estonians and Red Army had heavy battles, both sides were carrying out attacks. Soviet Latvian army with allocated Russian units and the 7th army tried to go on offensive to protect Pskov. On 21st February Reds lost Alūksne. On 3rd March 6th Reserve Corps and all subordinated forces started a joint offensive. The goal was to reach Lielupe line and thus shorten the front line against the Red Army. The longest distance had to be overcome by the 1st Guards Reserve Division, even if against weaker Red forces. The first part of the operation had a code name Tauwetter, Thor. Landeswehr that had recently taken Ventspils did not participate in this phase. Latvian battalion attacked in Saldus direction. The main enemy's stronghold was Mazeikai that was located between Iron Divisions and 1st Guards Reserve Divisions sectors. Mazeikai was taken in the second attempt, but overall the first phase of the operation proceeded successfully, even surpassing its goals. On 10th March, a second phase began with the codename Ice Gang, Ice Drift. On this day, flank of the 1st Guards Reserve Division, chasing the Red Reating Red Army, took Šauljai. Whole frontline moved forward successfully. A Landeswehr from vicinity of Kuldiga reached Tukums. 
On 17th of March, a third phase began, Frühlingswind or Spring Wind. The goals of this phase were ambitious. The right flank had to surround Jalgova from the east and cut off all retreating Red Army's forces. Nothing went according to this grandiose plan. A Landeswehr's front stretched from the sea to Latvian battalion. Latvians were halfway between the sea and Jalgova. Further south with the front against Jalgava was Iron Division. The 1st Guards Reserve Division was approximately along Latvian border, with its front almost directly to the north. Further south was another German 52nd Army Corps. While Iron Division had heavy fights quite far from Jalgova, Landeswehr's main forces in Tukums got the message that the road to Jalgova is free. Landeswehr, without knowing von der Goltz's ambitious plans, decided to take advantage of the opportunity and conquer Jalgova, which they did. Landeswehr took Jalgova in a strike in the rear of Red Army and reported that by the radio. Now Red Army units were running to the east, evading the encirclement. Iron Division also reached Jalgova and in the successful days they together defended the city from strong Red Army's attacks. Meanwhile the Reds took Tukums again, but then left it themselves. Latvians finally received reinforcements and on 20th March reformed the battalion into 1st Latvian Independent Brigade. Now the front lied on both sides of Lielupi. Warfare froze for some while. After these events some heavy fighting started in the north. There was large-scale Red Army's offensive, but again the result was relatively small. Changes in front line to the one or another side. In the end of March there was a 1st Latvian unit in Estonian 2nd Division, 1st Valmier Infantry Regiment. On 31st March a North Latvian Brigade was established with the order of Estonian Commander of Chief. In the beginning of April the Red Army had taken the initiative and started attacking, although all attacks were repulsed. The second part of a month had a thaw and that decreased the activity on the front. The main news were brought by the political front. Baltic Germans didn't really like the idea of a democratic Latvian state. Democracy meant a complete loss of their historical privileges. Commander of 6th Reserve Corps General von der Goltz as well would like to see Latvia disappear and Baltic Germans take the power in the country. General himself had far-fetching military political plans in which large role was played by German army that currently was fighting in Latvia. Early in the month he had already got rid of German soldiers' democratic institutions that had been established since the German Revolution. What happened next definitely was part of a unified plan. On 16th April a newly arrived German unit decided to disarm Latvian soldiers in Liepāja. Meanwhile, simultaneously, a Baltic German unit from Landeswehr decided to arrest Latvian government. The plan succeeded only partly. Latvian government escaped and found shelter under Great Britain's guard. Latvian army units that were formed in Liepāja and surroundings were disbanded. Outside of Liepāja it even came to a shootout with one Latvian battalion after which Germans had to retreat. Nevertheless, Latvian government sent a message that resistance should cease in name of joint campaign against Reds. Then Latvians let themselves be disarmed. Baltic Germans formed a new government that was loyal to them and guaranteed Baltic German privileges in Latvia. This coup was a failure. Latvian government still existed and stayed on a ship in Liepāja port. The parliament declared that it recognizes only the lawful government. Pro-German government had problems to find people to fill the cabinet of ministers. Latvian brigade, while being in the front, refused to be involved in formation of military directory. None of the allied countries recognized this marionette government and continued to support the old, lawful provisional government. Latvians continued to fight side by side with Germans to fulfill the main goal, to free Latvia from communists. Situation on the front line stayed unchanged for a while. At first German government was satisfied with the army's accomplishments to protect state borders and didn't really want German soldiers to be involved in further battles. First Guards Reserve Division was already being evacuated back to Germany. But in Latvia it was clear to everybody that the next goal should be the capital Riga. Latvians wanted to save the capital, Germans wanted to save the captive citizens of German nationality. In the middle of the month political questions were solved and the plan to liberate Riga was like this. Attack on Riga had to be carried out only by local forces, Latvians and Baltic Germans, but German army would assist in the operation. In the front line in the north there was Latvian Brigade, then Landeswehr, then further from Riga, Iron Division. The operation had to start on 22nd May. 
The fact of the offensive being prepared was known to the leadership of the Red Army. At this moment, the army of Soviet Latvia's front line had extended over northern Lithuania and included all the Red forces there. Couple days before the planned offensive, the Red Army itself attacked. Attacks happened near the shore, against the bridgehead to the east of Lielupe, against Bauska in the southern flank. These attacks started on 18th May, but were repulsed everywhere. Attacks continued three more days, fights were especially hard near Bauska on 21st of May. None of them changed the overall situation. Attacks would have continued on 22nd May if white forces wouldn't start their offensive. The main attacking column of mostly Landeswehr's forces scattered the Reds and rushed towards Riga. They managed to outpace the enemy and move behind its back. Latvian forces were driving the enemy along the shore, the Iron Division attacked from Jalgava. About noon Landeswehr was in Riga, in the afternoon Riga was reached by Iron Division. Everybody who was a communist or could be suspected to collaborate with communists was shot, and later that would be labeled as the White Terror. Liberation of Riga ended with a complete collapse of the Red Army. Army of Soviet Latvia retreated to the east, losing many deserters. Estonian army used an opportunity and moved forward, without finding an enemy ahead. So the Red Army had hastily retreated and the following white armies occupied Riga and surroundings. Estonian army had occupied north of Latvia and with its forward units moved as far as Daugava. And this is how sides of the anti-communist forces met. Landeswehr units moved forward and were surprised to find Latvians of Estonian army in their way. That was an unpleasant surprise because they supported the local government. A conflict was brewing, this time between armies that should have been allies against the Red Army. Latvian forces were divided between these two sides. The eastern group of Latvian army was in Riga and east of Riga, soon they moved to their front sector against the Red Army. The northern group of the Latvian army consisted of two regiments, one on the front near Daugava, other in town of Cesis. Landeswehr's leadership clearly understood that Latvians didn't intend to fight neither against each other nor against Estonians. On 2nd June a German delegation arrived in Cesis, where they declared that Landeswehr's goal is to occupy all Latvian territory. To that they received an answer that it is already liberated from the Red Army and thus Landeswehr would be moving in the rear of the actual front line. Afterwards multiple attempts of both sides to start negotiations followed. On 6th of June, Landeswehr attacked Cesis, that was defended by a weak Latvian Cesis regiment and two Estonian armored trains. Germans took Cesis. Estonian units of nearby 3rd Division arrived and next two days Estonians unsuccessfully tried to retake the town. On 10th of June, an armistice came into effect. Negotiations followed with mediation of allied countries, England, France and the United States. Despite US representatives standing on the German side, overall allies supported the lawful provisional government and refused to consider the demands for Estonians to leave Latvia. Landeswehr couldn't get what it wanted through negotiations and started to prepare a war against Estonia. Since Germany had forbidden Germans to participate in any internal fights, on 18th June Iron Division went into the service of the marionette government. White Russians refused to participate in coming battles and were transported to the west. Latvian units thoughtfully were kept away from the northern front. The German plan was to attack in two columns. The western one with Iron Division's forces that had to create a far encirclement of the enemy. The eastern column was Landeswehr's forces that had to take Valmier and move to Valka. Germans absolutely underestimated the strength of Estonian army that had concentrated several regiments at the front. On 19th of June, German Iron Division started to move. This column got forward but then gradually stopped. On 21st June, Estonians started a counterattack and the Iron Division had to retreat. Only on this day, when the Western Column was already retreating without reaching its goal, Landeswehr's attack started. Again, it started with success, Landeswehr attacked the meeting point between Latvian and Estonian units. However, after bending the front line to some distance, Landeswehr was stopped and on the next day started to retreat. Simply put, Cesis battles had ended. Germans retreated towards Riga, but Estonians and Latvians followed. Germans occupied new positions along the lakes northwest of Riga. Here they swapped places and now Landeswehr was on the western flank and Iron Division on the eastern. On 28th June, Jugla battles started. The Landeswehr's flank was forced to retreat, Iron Division still held. These battles were quite bloody and they stopped when on 3rd July an armistice was agreed. Germans admitted that they had lost and left Riga. The legitimate Latvian provisional government had turned to the capital. German army had to evacuate to Germany according to the armistice.
July was the time of big reorganizations on all sides of the front. Army of Soviet Latvia had become a regular Red Army's army, the 15th Army, already in June, subordinated to the Western Front. Both Latvian divisions were again united into one Latvian Rifle Division. The 15th Army had one or two Russian Rifle Divisions too. Legitimate Latvian provisional government had returned to Riga and both sides of Latvian Army united. Army was organized in three divisions, with three infantry regiments each. Estonian army left Riga's surroundings and went back. Part of the front line in northern Latvia against the Red Army stayed in Estonian hands for a while. Landeswehr, after the defeat, was located in Tukums and finally submitted to Latvian government. All German citizens had to leave. White Russian forces, which had fought against Red Army, left Latvia and were transported to the White Northwestern Army. Yet not all White Russians had left Latvia. During summer, under German patronage, there was a new White Russian force founded with the name Western Volunteer Army. It was forming in the rear from Russian war prisoners and had not been on the front lines against the Red Army yet. Overall, in August, there was very little military action in Latvia. There were local battles in the front line around Livan, which didn't change the situation on the map. Around the end of August, in the south of Dolgopil's direction, also in Latvian territory, Lithuanians and mostly Poles achieved territorial gains against the Reds. Meanwhile, in Jalgova, Western Volunteer Army continued its formation. Different German Freikorps united under the core of ex-Landeswehr soldiers and formed the German Legion. There was a neutral zone between the Latvian army and the German army that moved south as Germans evacuated. There was no formal war against the Germans, therefore there was a hope the German army will peacefully move out of Latvia. On 24th August, when Iron Division had to start evacuation, it declared that it will stay, thus violating the order. German soldiers began to join Western Volunteer Army. In September, Landeswehr was sent to the front line against the Red Army and acquired its own sector near Daugava. With that, a possibility of Landeswehr going over to German side in the case of war was prevented. The German Legion and the Iron Division went into the service of the Western Volunteer Army, thus formally quitting the German service. On 28th September, the Polish Army attacked the Red Army's positions at Daugavpils, clearing the southern bank of Daugava. During this operation, for the first and only time, tanks were used in Latvian territory. In the beginning of October, the Germans had stopped receiving supplies from the German government. That meant that the Western Volunteer Army had no way out. It had to evacuate Germans to Germany, while Russians had to be transported to reinforce Northwestern Army that just started the offensive to Petrograd. Instead, the Western Volunteer Army decided to attack Latvia with the goal to conquer Riga and obtain it for themselves as a base. With Riga in hands of Western Volunteer Army, political conditions would be in its favor, and the Allies sooner or later would start to support the victorious side. Biggest and strongest part of the Western Volunteer Army was Germans, Iron Division and the German Legion. In general, they were located thus. The Russian Corps was on the western side, Iron Division on the southern, German Legion on the eastern flank. The main strike against the Latvian army had to be made by the German Legion along Daugava with the goal to break through the front line and cut Latvian escape route. The Iron Division would move from Jalgava, Latvian army would be surrounded on the western coast of Daugava. Undefended Riga on the other side would easily fall, of course only if Germans would get to the bridges in time. Just before this offensive, preparations for which were well known to Latvian army, new battles started for Livani on the eastern front. Livani was taken and frontline moved forward, but commander-in-chief had to stop this operation. German attack was expected to start at any day and an operation in the east would tie up necessary forces. Riga was protected by units from Latgale Division and Vidzeme Division, some units of which were positioned along Daugava or in reserve. Directly opposite the main German attack was Riga Regiment. German-Russian offensive started on 8th October. Mainly Russian force took Jurmala from western direction. German legions started their attack as planned in Latvian army's eastern flank. Already at the first forward position the legion was delayed for half a day. Iron Division 2 did not get far in the beginning. Only in the evening, in the complete darkness, the front line was bent along the highway in the main direction of Iron Division's attack. On the first day, Western Volunteer Army didn't achieve the expected goals on the main assault direction, and Latvian Army was even counter-attacking. 
On 9th October, operations of the German Legion were more effective. As a result, by the evening, Riga regiments started to retreat. The rest of the front line was holding, but the weak point near the urban area and bridges was dangerous. Latvian Army High Command decided to leave the western side of the city and ordered all forces to move to the other bank. Late evening on 9th October, all units had moved over Daugava. German arrival was noticed only in the morning of the next day. Later, commander of Riga regiment was blamed for chaotic organization of the defenses and retreat of the whole front line. So, on one hand, the German-Russian army had beaten the Latvian army and taken a lot of territory, but on the other, the plan to destroy the Latvian army did not succeed. Riga was not occupied, only its neighborhoods on the other side of the river. After the first part of the operation, Western Volunteer Army left Russians along the sea and in the west, Aryan division in Riga, but the German legion went to the opposite direction as before, to the east. There was a plan B. Meanwhile, high command of the Latvian army decided to quickly regain initiative and take back Bolderaya, to the west from the estuary. It was known that it was mainly occupied by the weakest part of enemy army, Russians. Daugava was to be crossed in river boats. It was agreed with allied countries, English and French, about support of naval artillery. To divert enemy's attention, Daugava was crossed in a location to the south of Riga and a temporary bridgehead was created there. On the day of operation, Latvian army units had to attack over the bridges inside the city. This operation started on 15th October. The main losses were at the bridge attacks. The objective was achieved. Germans couldn't support their left flank, where forces of Latgale division were landing. In the next two days, Latvian army moved along the bank on the western side of Daugava and stabilized the front line there. The bridgehead to the south of Riga was abandoned. The front line near Riga remained fixed for a while. Meanwhile, the German legion was moving east, pushing away the sparse Latvian forces to the south of Daugava. Western Volunteer Army's plan B was to gain control of Daugava crossing in Jaunjalgava. On 19th October, German legion attacked defenders' positions. The defenders, about three companies, successfully drove off all attacks. The Germans suffered losses so high that they couldn't continue their operation. Further hostilities in this area continued further to the west. Nothing much happened in the later part of October, except for Russian units moving in almost undefended northern Latvia. Now Western Volunteer Army was making appeals to the Allies for the mediation of truce. Latvia didn't intend to negotiate. On 3rd November, a large-scale Latvian army offensive started with an objective to liberate Riga and then push the Germans and Russians out of Latvia. The main attack from Bolderai was undertaken by reinforced Latgale division, while other divisions diverted the enemy's forces on other locations. Serious help was given by Allied naval artillery, without which Latvian operations would be enormously harder. As before, Russian units didn't offer much resistance, however, Iron Division's resistance was much fiercer. On 9th November, Latvian army was encircling Riga from the northern and western directions. On the next day, Latvians entered Riga, and on 11th November, Riga was completely liberated. German-Russian army retreated to Uolaini positions. Meanwhile, important events were developing in Liepāja. Liepāja was already left by German army in the summer, as the relations between Germany and the Allies became worse. In the beginning of November, Germans advanced and took several settlements near Liepāja. Majority of German units were part of the 1st Guards Reserve Division, that had returned to Latvia. On 14th November, these forces started to attack Liepāja. There was a line of forts around Liepāja that was meant to defend this important imperial portal city. In the beginning, Germans managed to take several of the forts and Latvians were retreating. But immediately after reordering, the Latvian garrison went to counterattack and regained the forts. Here too, Latvian army was supported by Allied naval guns. On the same day the situation was restored, Germans didn't repeat their attacks. Latvian army liberated Njurmala on 14th of November. Further from Riga, Latvian army pushed back Western Volunteer Army from Daugava to southeast. About that time, a message arrived that an Allied mission is coming to Latvia with the goal to stop the hostilities and reconcile the sides, just like after Cesis battles. The Allies still had hopes to somehow use German-Russian army against the Red Army. That meant that Latvia had to be liberated as soon as possible before the Allies had involved themselves into matters. On 17th November, Western Volunteer Army High Command stepped down and German Army took over the leadership of all forces. Around that time, Latvian Army threatened the enemy's last base in the Algava. On 18th November, Germans arranged a counterattack on the whole front line with the objective to push it back and burn down every house to deny Latvian Army any shelter and therefore stall its progress. 
This offensive didn't achieve its objective, only bent the front line in the area of Riga Highway. German 6th Reserve Corps still sent a message to Latvian army asking for a ceasefire that Latvia ignored. On 21st November, Latvian army had surrounded Jalgov from three sides and the Germans had to leave the city. All former Western Volunteer Army's forces retreated from Latvia. In the last battles in Lithuania, Lithuanians too joined the fighting against the retreating enemy. At the start of December, there was no German-Russian army in Latvian territory anymore. It finished evacuation from Lithuania to Eastern Prussia on 13th December. Latvian army finally could pay attention to the Latvian East to liberate Latgale from Red Army. There was no great activity in the Eastern Front against the Red Army in November and December. The Red Army was busy defending against the offensive of the Northwestern Army to Petrograd. With huge effort, units of Latvian army were being transported to the Eastern Front. Meanwhile, a strong ally was found in Polish army. Also, it was clear that there should be no delay because the Red Army had defeated the Whites in the north and was about to sign an armistice with Estonia and therefore now could reinforce their Latvian front. Year 1920 began. Estonia signed ceasefire with Russia on 3rd January. According to this ceasefire, neither side was allowed to remove forces from the front, but it was anticipated that the Red Army would not honor this agreement. In Latvian Army's front against the 15th Army, there was Kurzem Division, Latgal Division and Landeswehr. Further, there was Polish Army with three divisions. In the south, Latvian Army Group was subordinated to Polish Army Group. The offensive started on 3rd January. Latvian Army crossed the river west from Daugavpils and quickly moved toward its goals. Polish forces moved from the east. The Red Army foresaw that Daugavpils was being encircled and hastily abandoned the city. In the same day, Polish Army and later Latvian Army entered Daugavpils. The offensive continued for the next two days. Next part of the operation had to happen in the far north flank. This operation was delayed a couple of days and started on 9th January. Latvian Army's attack was directed towards an important railroad hub, Pitalovo. The battles here were heavy, because the Red Army constantly moved plenty of new units from other fronts. Pitalovo was taken only on 14th January. According to the plan, the third part of the operation could start. On 20th January, an operation against Rezekne began. Latvian army attacked the city from several directions, while Landeswehr's mission was to encircle it from the east. The encirclement ended with Landeswehr taking Rezekne when the Red Army and communist officials had already managed to flee. With that, the front line against the Red Army was shaped in a more or less straight line. The battles continued for the rest of the month as the Latvian army moved towards the state border. On the 1st February, in Moscow, Latvia signed a ceasefire with the Soviet Russia. According to it, the Red Army had to move to the east and leave Latvian territory where it was still occupied. The ceasefire was kept in secret from the public. The Red Army didn't even try to fulfill its agreement and the Latvian army still had to move forward with local battles. After that, there was a period of scout activity. In the march, there was a thaw and all activity in the front line decreased. Peace negotiations continued in Moscow, later they were taking place in Riga. They ended with signing a peace treaty on 11th August 1920 that established an eternal peace between Latvia and Russia. Latvian independence was secured.